Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Radio Days, a podcast radio program that delves into the world of terrestrial radio. It's DJs and on-air personality, and you, all fans of radio as a medium. Here's your host, Ron. Hello and welcome to episode two of season four, Radio Days, the podcast. You know, you can hear this podcast on Buzzsprout, as well as all major podcast platforms like Spotify, Google Podcasts. Uh, you can also watch this podcast via YouTube as well uh, as at my website, rodrobertsonstudios.com. Radio Days, the podcast, is sponsored today by Radio Days 101 Years of Radio. A lot of radio days in there. This is a new docuseries uh, about the history of terrestrial radio. You can hear the story from those who lived it. Dick Purton, Doug Podell, Duke Facour, Big Jim Edwards, Ken Calvert, Jill Forsythe, just to name a few of the scores of radio personalities and historians who appear in this docu series. You can also watch the entire five part documentary uh, on the free streaming service Reveal, which is R E V E E L. Uh, Reveal, it's a free streaming service, as well as uh, Vimeo. You, you can watch that on demand. You can rent it or purchase it. And you can find out more about that at my website, ronrobinsonstudios.com. My guest today is one of those radio personalities who appears in this docu series, and he was fantastic, told a lot of great stories. Radio Days, 101 Years of Radio is another place you can hear my guest. He's been heard on WJR 760 WDFN in Detroit, as well as WSPD SPD in Toledo. Currently, he can be heard on his very brand new podcast called Off the Air. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome fellow Specs Howard alum, Mr. Sean Belegian. Sean, how are you, my friend? Excellent. It's a pleasure to chat with you again, bud. Uh, congratulations on, on everything so far, including this uh Fantastic venture you're involved with now. Yeah, no, it's it's nine years. My first interview was with Dick Kernan. My last was with Ken Calvert. So it took nine wow. years to put that together. So thank you wow. again for being a part of it, man. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a you know that's the one thing that uh, I I think a lot of people like guests have in common. There there is a love for radio there, and and it's never going to die. I know that the the medium has changed, the industry has changed so much. Right, and, right. I've been joking a lot the last few months. I still love radio. I'm not sure radio loves me, but <laughs> I'm always I'm always going to love radio. I mean, it was something that, you know, I grew up with and listening in, in bed at night and everything. So, yeah, it's, it's a love affair that's never going to end. Ron, honestly, I think it's, it's, it's just one of the best things out there. I really do. So before we get into your career, uh, Sean, I want to ask you what, uh, and this is a common question I ask a lot of my guests, what were you listening to on the radio growing up? I think like so many other kids, especially sports fans, it was, you know, listening to Tiger games, um, you know, on, on WJR, listening to the great Ernie Harwell, staying up uh, late at night and listening to uh, Red Wing games and, you know, telling my mom and dad I was asleep and, you know, putting that transistor radio right underneath my pillow and just turning it up just enough where only I could hear it, but it couldn't go throughout the door. So that was obviously something that I listened to. And then, you know, when Casey Kasem and, and America's Top 40 started, yeah. like every other kid, that was like the cool thing on a Sunday morning, you know, is, is to try to listen to that and write down the the songs as fast as you could and everything. So, well, that was um, the only way I you could, a, you, that was the only way you could find out what was number one. That was the only 100%. way. 100%. Yeah, 100%. You know, and that's even before, remember, they had that America's Top 10 that started on television. That's even before that started on television. So um, I had a very eclectic taste in, in music. I mean, like so many other guys where I grew up, you know, I, I like the the rock stuff. You know, I, I was into ACDC and, and Black Sabbath and Ronnie James Dio and everything, but I had an incredibly eclectic uh, taste in music, and, and that continues until this day. So we listened to some of the programming, but obviously you grew up in the Detroit area. Who were some of the personalities that you enjoyed listening to? Obviously, you said Casey, but the, some of the local guys. Talk about that. Oh, my gosh. I mean, like, like so many other kids, I mean, Arthur P. was uh, unbelievable. You know, the the, the 5 o'clock uh, whistle and, you know, it's Maui time and, and all of it's that. It's the weekend. Um, yeah, right? I mean, it, that was and, – and, and Q Weekend Warriors, you know, they, they, you would roll with that. And uh, love J.J. in the morning crew. Man, that was – for me, that was driving to school in high school, you know, having on JJ and the morning crew and, and, and listening to that. And, you know, I, I thought they had a fun, fun run on wheels. I, I really enjoyed their, their run on wheels. And, 
And then like so many other guys, you know, and I've said this to Drew Lane himself. I mean, to me, um, being in college and, and um, finishing up school and trying to get into this business, it is synonymous with listening to Drew and Mike going yeah. back to the summer of 94 and their OJ coverage. I mean, it was side splitting stuff. And Ron, that was always to me, that's always the telltale sign is when you don't want to get out of your car. Yeah. When when you're when yep. you're sitting in your car, even though you know you're gonna be late, uh, guys are doing something right. And it boy, it was like that every day for me with with uh you know Drew and Mike in, in, in that era, you know, the, the whole summer well, of OJ. Oh. Not just OJ, but look at all the other things. They had the, the Mr. Harris. They had Bell for Blows. Was there anything more funny when they would ring the bell when they could get the donut shop terrorism bell for oh, Blows? I mean, and so then, good. And, and, and then the, the calls that they would, they would get numbers of, of celebrities in hotels and they would just call them and, and just, they were so good. Top to bottom. 100%. All three of them. Yeah, Trudy it, as well. Oh, I, Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I've always, I, I think Drew is just brilliant. I, I think he's brilliant beyond his years. I think, you know, to this day, some of the stuff that guy does, you know, it, he's it's still thinking, killing it. Yeah. It's just thinking next level. I mean, that's the way he's been for so long. So yeah. And, and you know what, then I, I went through that phase where, I mean, it was Lisa, Lisa, everybody yeah, Lisa, was listening Lisa. to Lisa, yeah. Lisa for a while too. <laughs> so, uh, the electrifying mojo, oh I mean, gosh. I, I, I fell in love with radio, Long before I even realized that that was something I wanted to get into. There's something, I know it sounds cheesy, but the whole theater of the mind and everything, yep. uh, there, there's certain validity to that. So much like you and myself, there's a lot of people out there who grew up listening to radio, loving the medium. But uh, it's another thing to jump into that uh, that spectrum. Talk about what made you decide to get into broadcasting and talk a little bit about your time at Specs Howard, if you would. I couldn't imagine even now, I couldn't imagine doing anything different with my life than what I've done in the last 30 years. I, no regrets, you know, well, some regrets, but they're minor regrets. They're not regrets where you say, oh, I should have done something else in life. You know, maybe I shouldn't have jumped into that job. Maybe I shouldn't have jumped into that job, but they're all so minor. I wouldn't have changed a darn thing, Ron, not, not a, not a darn thing. And, you know, I tell young people all the time, you know, I'm not sure you know what you're getting into, you know, I mean, like so many other guys, Ron, and I'm sure you included, you know, you're asked to speak to young people or a young person will reach out to you. And I always say the same thing. It isn't the same industry. You know, when no. I broke in in 1995, it was a different industry. It's, it's, you know, sadly it's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a it's an industry right now that I don't want to say it's on its last breath, but it needs a new breath. There's there's no, no doubt about that, and I'm not sure where it's coming from. But um, it, but it's also a tough business, and I don't sugarcoat it for anybody. Um, I loved my experience at Specs. Absolutely loved it. Um, you know, Dick Kernan. I, I'm going to join in the parade of people saying wonderful things about Dick. Dick challenged me. Um, Dick saw something in me at a time that I didn't think I saw it in me. You know what I mean? Right. And so, um, you know, Tom Prophet was a guy and Jim Bell. And uh, I, I always called him Mike Paul Mateer, former Maple Leaf <laughs> goaltender. Um, you know, so for me, having those guys have the impact that that they did. And, and, and quite frankly, Ron, I'm old enough to say it now, and, and you don't feel like a big wimp about it, giving me the confidence I didn't have in myself. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I, I think at that age, you you try to convey a confidence, but deep down inside, you know, I, I had serious doubts because, you know, I mean, to this day, I, I, I hope and pray that, um, you know, puberty hits and my, my voice <laughs> deepens, but I think by the, now I'm 53, I don't think it's going to happen, but um, they gave me a confidence uh, that, that I didn't really have in myself, and I, I would vouch for that experience every day for the rest of my life. Yeah. It, it worked wonders for me. You know what? I, I was a guy who was fortunate. You know, I had college behind me, but specs was that final push. And that was pretty cool. You know, earlier you were talking at the beginning of your answer, you were talking about like going back. I they asked me to come back and speak to a graduating class, like 2019, right before COVID. And you want to talk about, I, I went and, and I spoke just like you said, look, it's, this is hard. You got to want it. You you gotta you gotta say yes to things that you might you know to to do you just gotta you gotta want it you gotta try, and um, after I was done I went back in the lobby 
and I was waiting to, if anybody wanted to come and talk to me. And I'm not kidding, Sean. I had never met the man, but I could I saw him right away because I knew what he looks like. <laughs> Willie Horton walked up to me. Wow. His granddaughter had just graduated. He came over and he said, "Hey, I want to thank you for that cuz that speech he was talking, he was he just gave me accolades for my speech and I was like, did I die and go to have Willie Horton just approached me and said that I did so something cool. good? Are you kidding me?" So that's <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that happens in broadcasting. Yeah. And and yeah. and I do want to ask you a couple more questions about Specs Howard, but to that point, let's let's just jump into it. Can you talk to me about some of the cool things you were like? I can't believe this is happening. This ha- this doesn't happen if I'm not radio broadcasting. There are Ron. I could waste the next 15 minutes of your life. <laughs> I mean, there there are there are things that I, I look back on. I I think while it's happening, you don't take the time to smell the roses, right? You, you know, while it's happening, you just, you're kind of going with the flow, especially, you know, when you're having some success, you're, you're, you're kind of focused on the next thing. And, um, you know, whether it be going to Super Bowls, whether it be going to Stanley Cups, whether it be, you know, on Radio Row, whether it be guys that I covered that legitimately became friends, like yeah. like friends, not right. just guys that I know, but friends and um, Darren McCarty, right? One of the things, you know. Yeah, for you know uh, Lomas Brown. I mean, uh, you know, so many guys in particular in the hockey world from, you know, calling so many games and doing so many different shows. That yeah, it 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 really is. I've probably thought about it more in the past few months than I had in the previous twenty nine years. You know, because. Like I said, and I'm not having a pity party or anything like that. I, I think it's important to know when it's time to go do something else. I've kind of come to grips with the fact that I'm I'm probably not going to get another job in radio. And I, I'm, I'm cool with that. Right. You know, I've got <laughs> enough going on in my life where, you know, I'm calling games and doing some TV stuff and now trying this new podcast venture. So uh, no regrets other than, you know, again, a couple decisions that, that I made along the way that I, I wish I could have a do-over. But I've thought more uh, about some of the stuff that I've done and, you know, um, maybe some of the accolades that came in, you know, the the ratings, you know, whether they were good or bad, honest to goodness, I'm not joking. It didn't mean a darn thing to me, but it is pretty cool to be recognized by, you know, your peers in the, in the past and, you know, have some of those things. It's, it's the memories and the things that, people bring up all the time, you know, right. things that you did yeah. 19 years ago. My daughter just turned 19 years wow. old Wow! and I posted something on Facebook and there were probably 20 people that made a reference to crack baby, <laughs> crack babies, 19 years ago, for goodness <laughs> sake, funny. you know, and my daughter even said, she goes, dad, do these guys all realize that like I'm 19 now and everything. <laughs> so, you know, are, are people always making reference to Mita and, you know. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a bit. The, the march that we did, you know, uh, with, with Matt for, Millen, you know, yeah. when, when we had it with Millen. So many silly things, but a lot of good memories. And I, I'm glad that, you know, a few people out there remember some of the silly things we did. You know, it's it's no secret you're known for sports. And, and I, Bill McAllister and I went to Specs together in the same class. And we, were, mm-hmm. we, we created this uh, fictional uh, sports station that we wanted to create. And never did I dream that I was going to, you know, come out of spec. Luckily, I think Bill got a job with 97 running out of the jump. But uh, I wanted to ask you, because I know this talking to you, when you were going to specs, WDFN was your station. How did you go from being a student to like, okay, now I'm rubbing elbows. Now I am WDFN. Talk about that. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, you know, I'm going to say the same thing. So they launched in the summer of 94. And after I got done listening to Drew and Mike, you know, right. doing all their OJ stuff, the, the coolest thing was driving to school and listening to the fan and just thinking to myself, my gosh, how cool would this be? And that was, that was a life goal. I'm not going to lie. That was something that I thought was probably 10 years away. Uh, but in, in all actuality, it was just a few years away. And um, uh, I give all credit in the world to to Greg Henson. And I think you and I talked about this during the documentary. I, I'm convinced that Greg doesn't get the credit that he deserves. I'm not just talking for me. I'm talking in general for making yeah. sports radio the vehicle that it is today in this market. I, I don't think Greg gets the credit he deserves. But um, – I met Greg at opening day. 
I don't 98, 99. I don't remember. And in typical Greg fashion, he walked up to me and he goes, Hey, I, I, I heard your shows on that other station. I was like, Oh, thanks, Greg. You know, I've listened to you for years and typical Greg, he goes, what the hell are you doing over there? Why don't you come work for me? <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, t- Let go of my Greg, arm. but right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to, to able to be able to start working there, I, you know, Ron, I was only 28 years old, um, to be able to start working there and, 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 and do some weekend stuff and then do a show with Pate and then, you know, obviously have the long run that we did in, in mid in mid days with it is what it is. And, you know, finally to do mornings and afternoons with, you know, a guy who was legitimately a friend of mine. You know, I think, Ron, in this business, there are friends in the business and then there are friends. Right. And I, I've been fortunate to make some friends in the business. Uh, and I was very, very fortunate to, to make a real friend in Tom Kowalski and, uh, to be able to work with him for a couple of years, you know, uh, before his untimely passing was just unbelievable. And, 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 you know, doing afternoons on, on the fan with him was, was just so much, you know, fun. it's really too bad that he's not around to see this lions run, you know, God, would he oh. have loved this? Are you kidding me? Oh my goodness. Oh, would have loved every second of it, you know? And uh, he would have yelled at me for being a fan. That was the <laughs> argument that we always had. Cause I, I told him, I said, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I think both things can be true. I think you can be objective. Yeah. And I think you can be a fan. He's like, no, you can't be a fan. Listen, 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 let me tell you something. Let me tell you. And it's like, no, 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 you know, killer that that's the way it is. And, uh, listen and learn. I can, I, I can hear, hear it still, but, uh, yeah, he would have loved every second. Now, when you started the fan, I think there was the Stony and Wojo were doing their thing. I think Greg and Jamie were doing their thing. I think Rob and Mark were doing park. Who did you, for me, if I was in your shoes, I would have been totally like, you know, try to not to be a fanboy around Stony, but, did you, was there anybody specifically who, who you kind of learned the most from, or maybe kind of took you and said, Hey, this is how you do it, kid. No, you know, what was different, Ron. And I, I don't mean any disrespect to any of these guys. I think everybody worked so hard to get to where they were at that. I think everybody was just focused on the task at hand, as opposed to, you know, let's, let's, you know, help this kid up or help that kid up. And I hope that doesn't come across as disrespectful because it isn't. I understand it. This was a venture. Everybody was up to their waist in a venture that everybody thought was going to be gone like that. I mean, if you remember, there were some pretty big names out there that said, this is going to be gone in a couple of years. This isn't going to last. So I think everybody was so focused on the task at hand that, that maybe there wasn't the time to, to, you know, uh, grab the new kid by the scruff of the neck and everything. But um, I, I don't have anything derogatory to say about any of those guys, really. I, I, I wasn't there long when Mark and, and, and Rob were there. Okay. But, you know, um, my, you know, the tenure that, that I worked under, and I think we had more success in that tenure than any other, was, you know, Jamie and Brady in the morning and, and me in middays and, and, and Jim Rome and then, uh, Stony and Wojo, and we yeah. still had our specialty programming and things like that. And it was always fun to watch, uh, you know, Art Regner have his <laughs> rants. That was that was always a, a lot of fun before he moved on. And you know, it, it, I drew the short straw, and I had to do all those Lions post game shows. But um, yeah, it, it was what a special place to work. It, it, it we didn't realize it at the time. We really didn't. And when we were all working at Fox Two. Uh, when I say we, I, I mean, Jamie Wojo and myself, you know, did the, the Lions pregame show for so many years. We would wax poetically about those days at the fan. And a lot of times that's a crazy thing about the good old days. You don't realize you're living in the good old days until you're out of the good old days. Right. And, um, those were, those were the good old days. And I don't think any of us knew it. You know, I don't think, and I've said this to other people off the air is I don't think Jennifer Hammond gets enough credit to what she meant to the station early mm-hmm. on, but talk to mm-hmm. me from your perspective on the inside, how important was Don Swindell to that station? Oh my gosh. He was always had an idea. Always, always. I mean, just the simplest thing. I, I think, you know, for people that know him, he would get this twinkle in his eye, right? He would get this twinkle in his eye and you knew something, uh, you know, sarcastic was coming, something creative was coming, but no, you're right. I, I think Jen and, and, and let's not forget the late Sabrina. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. it, it was, it was a, it was a special place. You know, it, it really was, it was, it was a special place. And, 
um, full of creative people, you know, and, and, uh, certainly we, we lost a great one in Don not too long ago. Yeah, no, he, for those who don't know, he was the voice behind, you know, the Stoney and Wojo theme song. And, and he, ra- he was just a, he's an old musician who, who they get, he got this job and he just, he took it to another level. He, he was imaging for DFN. You guys were the stars, no question. no question, but that was the, that was the, that was the pace that kept all you guys together in my view. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And he, he always, you know, he always was quick to an idea. You could be having a conversation with him and he'd get that gleam in his eye and you're like, all right, what's going on with Swindell? <laughs> and, and Don would be the first guy to admit it. Don, I, I, I liken Don to like a baseball player, right? Well, a baseball player is a really good baseball player if you hit 333, right? <laughs> right? Don would probably tell you one out of his three ideas worked, but he kept swinging. And yeah. and like I said, a 333 guy will get you in the Hall of Fame. And as far yeah. as I'm concerned, Don Don's a Hall of Fame radio guy. I loved his Claude and Liu stuff. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah. Um, oh, well, so was DFN your first job in radio? That or, or not? Obviously, was to, was Toledo your first gig? How did that happen? How did you go from Specs to your first job? Talk about that. Um, you know what? I, I was, um, you know, I, like everybody else, I put out a bunch of stuff and, uh, I thought I was really close to getting a gig in South Bend. And then literally at the last minute, it, it, it wasn't meant to be. And, you know, I was heartbroken because I, you know, I think I'm a hockey guy first, but boy, I love college football and to be, um, you know, in the backyard of college football in South Bend for your first gig would have been a lot of fun, but everything happens for a reason. I ended up in Toledo, like smack dab in the middle of an ownership change. And with the ownership change comes a management change. So I was one of the first hires by management there. Um, And it was the right place at the right time. Uh, You know, so many times people, um, I don't think they give credit to being in the right place at the right time. I had a good stroke of luck being in Toledo in the summer of 1995 at that exact moment. So um, a lot of things came together where I was quickly able to to get on the air in a multitude of ways. And I was uh, able to quickly get into a broadcast booth right. um, and, and do sideline reportings for um, the Toledo Rockets, which I had a blast oh doing that football. Oh my gosh, football. I can't and, imagine how cool you that know, was. I, I had a chance to do sidelines and color and even play-by-play for a few games when our you know, play by play guy did some uh, television uh, things, but it was it was perfect. It was it like honestly, it, I, Ron. I say this all the time. It, it was very difficult to leave Toledo. It was very difficult to leave Toledo. That's how much fun I had. Down it's in a Toledo. lot of fun. It, it, you know, it I, was I, a special group of people. I've done some cool things in radio broadcasting, but as far as the most fun I've had is I worked at a station called WSGM in Southwest Michigan, just a half hour north of South Bend, ironically enough. And the most fun I ever had in broadcasting is on Friday nights, I'd host a show called Friday Night Fever. And over there, high school football is huge. And so you Benton Harbor, you got St. Joe, you got Lakeshore. There's just Baroda, Saugatuck, all that. That's huge. And so we would go on and we would take out cuts from touchdowns and, and we would, we would do like these, these recaps where we would, you know, play the sound and putting that together was just the most fun. And then going on the air and saying, you know, number seven for Benton Harbor, put him over there and just playing a clip for the, you know, and, and just doing that was so much fun. So I get that, but then yeah. how can you say, no, okay, I go from Toledo to now I'm going to go to the station that I, that I just, I, I love listening to that had to be, that is a no brainer, right? It was, yeah, I mean, it was no brainer. And, you know, it's, it's funny how life happens. I got in full time and then three weeks later I became a father. And so that was a big, that was a big, you know, reason why I knew that, you know, my son was coming and, you know, now he's 24 years old and Crazy. living off in LA. So, um, you know, I, I didn't know what I didn't know back then. And I, I think there's, there's probably some good in that. You know, I, I think the older you get, you kind of see things coming a mile away in this business. Uh, back then I didn't know what I didn't know, but uh, had a blast. And, you know, shortly thereafter, you know, I, I get asked to do some shows on a Friday night on Fox. And then they're like, Hey, why don't you do some shows on Sunday? And then, Hey, why don't you do yeah. all our hockey coverage? And Hey, why don't you do our Lions pregame show? And 
Um, to be able to do a column for the Detroit News for a couple of years was That's unbelievable cool. yeah. because, I mean, that was Sunday morning for me is spreading the newspaper all across the floor and studying the stats and everything. So, no, you're absolutely right. It, it, it You don't think about it while it's happening, but right. even now, you know, I'm 53 years old and it's just like, holy crap, did I really do all that? You know, I mean, you sit back and you're like, that's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a blast. And, um, oh boy, I had 12 great years at the fan. It's, you know, it's unfortunate how it ended. We all saw it coming though. You know, when they when made they, the decision not to FM, move to FM, yeah. we knew, we, we knew, but yeah. boy, it was fun while it lasted. Well, I know you had fun doing this and you kind of mentioned it earlier, but, uh, on December 9th, 2005, this a lot of people still know Sean Belegian from this. You uh, organized an angry fan march at Ford Field. Uh, yeah. You wanted to fire Matt Millen. His, I mean, it, it, it's almost, when you look back at now and all the things that happened and transpired when under his watch, it almost seems like, man, if there's anyone who ever stole money at a job, it was Matt Millen. And look, he was a respected NFL analyst. And he came to Detroit, and and it was almost like he OJ'd his career, didn't he? Yeah, I'll tell you what—he's a nice guy too. I, I, which is I really, mean that yeah. he was a he was a wonderful guy. He had no business being in that job, and I wish the Lions would have listened to me then because um, <laughs> I know what I'm you know, talking I mean, about. For him to, <laughs> yeah, for for him to stay almost three years more. I mean, it led to the imperfect season. Ron, I'll be honest with you though. I've said this many times, and I'll say it to you as well. I regret ever doing that. And I'll tell you why I regret doing that. Yeah. I'll tell you why I regret doing that. The way it was misconstrued really to this day bothered me. It was never about hating the lions. It was never about, um, you know, boycotting the lions. It was never about being anti lion. It was telling the franchise to wake up that, that Mr. Ford, this guy is running your franchise into the ground. And, um, you know, people misconstrued it. They, they misconstrued it. And there was a lot of heat that week. If you remember, there was a lot of pressure that week. And I think, unfortunately, there were some people in town as well that, um, you know, thought that we were just trying to cause trouble and incite a riot and things like that. And, um, so because of that, that's my regret from it. I, I, I really, it was, I knew what my intentions were. I, it sounds like you knew what the intentions were. I think the average fan knows out there what the intentions were. Uh, it, it was nothing more than to tell Mr. Ford and tell this franchise, this man is running this franchise into the ground. And, and you know, they didn't listen. And it was, and the irony of ironies, uh, September 24th, 2008, of all the people to kind of break the news that Matt Millen was getting fired, it was me. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the person that told me that news uh, made that comment, you know, kind of like, well, I think it's only right that that maybe you can throw this out there and everything. <laughs> you should so be the one to tell that, everybody. Uh, yeah, that Friday morning for for the news to come down that he was uh, cleaning out his, his desk. But as I said, I mean, Ron, he, he got the 2006 draft. He got the 2007 draft. He got the 2008 draft. Uh, the damage it was already done was just made worse. It really was. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it was fun. Um, it was a, a great memory. It's something that, you know, I, I, I've kind of come to grips that that's going to be synonymous with me, but boy, if I had a chance to do it over again, I, I don't, I don't think I would have done it. it. It ended up being more trouble than it was worth, to be honest with you. Oh boy. Another thing you're known for at the fan is, is Mita, uh, men eating <laughs> all the tasty animals. This is, yeah. I had actually forgotten about this till I was doing uh, some show prep for the show, but tell me about this, Sean. What was the genesis it was, of this? It was, so I don't know if you remember 2003, uh, PETA was putting out these like just inflammatory, yeah. um, you know, ads and everything. And I, I said, you know what? I've had enough, like, like, stop it. You do, you do what you want to do, but, but stop telling me and other people how to live our life. So we just, we decided to, to start a Mita. and the first one, there were maybe 200 people in, in, the parking lot at WDFN, a couple lions actually came over because they heard about it. And I think they just wanted a free meal. That, Ron, honestly, I, I think maybe 250 people there, maybe. And then the next year it grew. And then the year after that it grew. And then finally in 2008, um, there were probably 5,000 people wow. in the parking lot at CompuWare arena. And we had, 
so many different vendors handing out food. Um, like so many other ideas in this business, um, I think it's an idea that had a shelf life. And I think the shelf life, uh, quite frankly, expired because you know as well as I do. I know this is going to sound disrespectful to salespeople. It's not. I think salespeople saw that as a big sell. Well, that's not something to sell. Right. If the local ma and pa place in your backyard, Ron, decide that they want to come out and, and donate 25 pounds of their own Italian sausage, well, you should let them donate 25 pounds <laughs> right. of their Italian sausage. We don't have yeah. to charge them for donating 25 uh, pounds of their Italian sausage. But the sales staff saw dollar signs. That's their job. I respect that. But that's not the type of event to try to do that. Sure. Not when people are bringing their own things and not when local mom, pop places are saying, I'll bring a thousand wings or I'll, I'll bring 25 racks of ribs. So, right. I mean, think about the logic from that. I can't tell you how many times I had arguments with salespeople about that, where I said, they brought 25 racks of ribs. You want to charge them for bringing 25 racks of ribs. Am I, am I getting that straight? Well, you're mentioning them. Yes, because they brought 25 racks yeah. of ribs. This is a great event. It brings people together, sports fans, meet. Um, so I, I knew at that last one, that was probably the last one. We gave it one more go, but um, Ron, it was so corporate. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't Mita. The spirit was gone. <laughs> it was not. And they, was. they said that they wanted to continue it. And I said, go ahead. You don't have my name attached yeah, to it. Not me. And they said, well, we don't need your name. We okay. can do me to, you Knock know, this is for out. the radio station. I said, have a blast with it. Yeah. I said, I don't, I don't want anything to do with it. And of course it never happened. Um, but it, it was fun. Uh, you know, could we do something like that today? Probably not. You know, I mean, I, I think there, there are too many different things that would need to fall into place <laughs> to do something like that. But man, it was, for that little run, uh, it was it was a heck of a lot of fun. Another thing that cracked me up preparing for this show, Sean, is I actually because I remembered it when I read up on it, is is everybody knows the expression "drinking the Kool Aid." I mean, I'm drinking the Kool Aid yeah. as it pertains to the Lions right now. But for a short time, Sean Belegian he has always been a trendsetter. But you started getting people instead of drinking the Kool Aid, you got people to, because of your your Lions post game show, ironically enough, but eating the cornbread. Eating the cornbread. Yeah. Where, where did this expression come from? Is this a family thing? Yeah, you know what? Uh, honestly, it was, I always, you we're, we're slaves to the lions. We, we're, we are, we're just slaves to the lions. And they are going to serve us, you know, uh, bad Kool-Aid and they're going to serve <laughs> us bad cornbread and tell us how good it is. And we'll keep coming back to get more. And, uh, you know, that was uh, during Camp Happy Times and, and um Joey Blue Skies, you know, people oh, still ball game. make reference to Joey Blue Skies, which which is kind of funny. I, I'll never forget watching a game on one of the national games, and Troy Aikman goes, you know, in Detroit, they call him Joey Blue Skies. And I was like, <laughs> hey, I know the guy that did that. So um, that was that was pretty funny. But, um, yeah, boy, that that decade of despair, gosh, that that took years off my life. And, you know, then I then I – said, you know, cider mill moments. And people still use cider mill moments to this day. You know, that moment in time on a Sunday where you know that nothing good's going to happen the rest of the Lions game, so you go escape to the local cider mill. Yates, yeah. And and salvation lies with uh, cider and donuts. So, <laughs> it sure um, does. Yeah, we, we, still have, we, we still have some fun well, like that. I'm telling you right now, I'm bringing back. I'm, I'm going to start using eating the cornbread. I'm bringing it back. I'll give you credit. <laughs> I, the, I'll give you credit for it three times after that. It belongs to me. That's how I treat radio. Ah, that's not, no, that sound, wouldn't be the first time. But No, that, uh, it, no really, it, 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 uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot. Eating the cornbread are you eating the cornbread for the lions in 2024 or what 100 percent, 100 percent. it is amazing the difference that a a viable franchise can make and and having the right people in place ron i've said it a thousand times i, I cannot stand people that do the well this franchise stinks and they're always going to stink right. it is such bad logic and i don't think you're a history of sports. If you say that people thought that way about the dead things and mm -hmm. what happens, you get the, the right people in place. They hire the right people. And, and now the, the wings are known know, as the champions. Wings, the wings are have a whole different it. reputation than they did when we were growing up. 
the measuring stick for from 1995 till 2009 and the golden state warriors are another example you 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 hire the right people they bring in the right people and the golden state warriors kind of became the measuring stick so i think that's exactly what um sheila ford did she brought in you know brad holmes and and dan campbell and these guys have been working so well together and and it's about bringing in the right people and they've been able to bring in the right people you know it's a look a couple of weeks ago, it was a missed opportunity. It would have it would have been great to go to the Super Bowl a year early. I don't know if I buy that stuff. I think Kansas City is a very beatable team, but they have a good nucleus, and I trust Brad Holmes to keep building around that nucleus. So it's going to be fun. Last season, not this past season, but the season before that, when they started one and six, I had a lot of friends on Facebook just going down to the game, spending all this money, and I was like. I start I st- when they were one and six that game where they went two and six that was the first game I had watched since Barry was in uniform like I missed all the right. Calvin Johnson I was done I was Lions free as they say and I tuned into that game almost to poke fun of my friends almost to get ammunition and then they won the game and they went two and six and then they went three and six and by the time they went four and six I was dr- I was like this feels different. How were they one and six to begin with? Because what I was seeing on the field was not anything I'd ever seen before. It was gradual for me, but it, but I was sucked in almost because as 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 a goof. I'm going to watch them as a goof, and I became a fan. And I got to tell you, I've never felt when Barry was when when they were beating the Cowboys thirty eight to three or whatever it was back in ninety one. I never yes. felt as confident as them winning as I do with this football team. It's never. No, I feel the same way. No, I feel the same way, and it. Um, Culture. I, it really, it's culture. It's amazing. Ron, I can't tell you how many times I've been down there over the years where, um, you know, I told this story a few weeks ago. Um, Lomas and I, gosh, I want to say it was 2018. I, I don't remember. All those bad years run together. But we were walking out of Ford Field. It's like the first or second week of November. And, and honestly, you leave the locker room, and it's almost like, you know, you're leaving, um, you know, a, a, a funeral. And, and we're, we looked at each other. I'll never forget it. We're walking out back to our cars down at Ford Field, and we're like, we have two months of this. Wow, yeah. We have yeah. two more yeah. months of this. <laughs> and, and I can't tell you how many times it was like that. Dan Campbell will never get enough credit. As much as we talk about it, I still contend he will never, ever get enough credit for changing the culture around here. That was that. the biggest battle, and by golly, and yes, I just used a statement from 1942. <laughs> By, golly. By golly, uh he changed he changed the culture. Now, as you're getting back to your, we could go off on a sports tangent. I love talking sports with you, but let's we were talking about the fan. Uh before we move on from the fan, could you talk about some uh, I asked you about uh, pinch me moments, but what are your, some of your highlights as far as wow, this is just this this is and that you recall fondly today that that happened while you were at 11:30 there. Um you know, so many, the anniversary parties were always special. They, they were, they were always special. You know, we brought in a bunch of, um, a bunch of fantastic guys, um, you know, which, which was cool. And a lot of the sports figures locally were, were always cool. I mean, um, you know, obviously doing a lot of the ice time shows during the Stanley cup runs was unbelievable doing the draft shows with Stoney. Stoney and I would go, uh, on the air at 11 o'clock back on draft Saturday and wow. we would do 11 to seven and it was just geek juice because I, we would always joke about it. You know what, Ron, it wasn't anything different that I wouldn't be doing at my house, except this time <laughs> I was on the radio with the guy like Stony and getting paid for it. So I, so many moments, I mean, really so many in, incredible moments and, you know, little road trips that we took and, and, and special, you know, this was back in the day, Ron, where we used to actually have, um, you know, radio nights at, at right. local bars and everything. And you used to do promotions where, you know, Miller would send you out two, three nights a week and everything. And man, I thought that was the coolest thing on earth. I'm not going to lie to you. So let me get this straight. You're going to pay me $300 to go hang out at a bar <laughs> for two hours. Okay. Okay, you know, so it, yeah, it was it was a special time in an era that I think is uh, unfortunately long gone. Well, what when when talk about leaving WDFN? Did you have another job or did you go to a job? Because because like you had mentioned, the writing was on the wall when uh, twelve seventy mm-hmm. went FM and became ninety seven one. 
you you guys and and eleven thirty didn't follow suit. It was it was kind of writing on the wall. But but you stayed on a little bit. But when did you leave? And what was your next gig after DFN? So in the summer of two thousand ten, when it became apparent to me that they weren't going to compete. Um, I thought I was doing the right thing. I, uh, and I told them like, literally I walked into our general manager's office and I walked into our OM and I said, I'm leaving next summer. Just so you know, there's going to be no surprise. I'm going to honor my contract, but I want you to know like a year in advance I'm leaving. So then two weeks beforehand, when, uh, I told, reminded them of that conversation, they acted like it was the first oh. time they heard it. And oh. I, I, how many times have we been there, right? right? Anybody who's been in this business. What do you we, mean you're we, leaving? It is amazing how uh, management sometimes doesn't <laughs> remember things. It's right. amazing how that works. So I told them, I said, well, okay, well, then consider this my two-week notice. And um, I think they thought I was bluffing. I really do. I think Or they maybe thought a I was money thing and, or something, right? Yeah, and it, no, I was done. Like, Ron, like, I, like, enough. You know, I mean, honestly, enough. And, um... The funny thing about it is, so on Sunday, three days before I was supposed to leave, Killer called me, and he begged me to do one more year. And and I said, it's not happening. We got into a massive argument. Oh, my a gosh. Massive, I mean, and I mean a That's massive argument, right? And um, after about 10 minutes after he hung up on me, he called me back. Uh, we kissed and made up. And basically, the management didn't know this. But he 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 got me to say, I'll do one more year. Uh, and there was something that we were kind of ogling for that doesn't need to be mentioned now. Um, Killer died the next morning. And oh, and uh, so I man. never had that conversation with management because when Killer passed away, I didn't feel the need to, to have that uh, conversation. But because he passed away, I decided to give them an extra uh, couple of months. And when a couple of months was over, it was, it was time to move on. It was... You know, especially after your partner dies and, and like a legitimate friend of yours dies, it was just time to do something else. You know, um, I, at the time, it's kind of crazy. I don't even, I guess I didn't really think about it. I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I knew there were opportunities out there. I was calling some hockey games, and I was kicking around the idea of doing some National Hockey League games, which, you know, eventually I got a chance to, you know, call some, and that, you know, no matter what happens the rest of my right. career, I can say I called games in the NHL, right. you know, that, right. that's a win. So, um, yeah, there was about a two month span where I, honestly it was, I was doing Wayne state football. I was doing a little of this and doing a little of that, but I didn't know what came next. And then, um, my old station in grand rapids called me and said, we'd love for you to do the afternoon show and, and you can do it out of your house in Northville. And, you know, we have wow. the technology, we can make it work. And, so I did that for a few years and it was, it was a fun time and, you know, working with Drew and working with a guy by the name of Grant, it, it was a fun time, but yeah, it, it's sad, you know, because I wish things could have been different at the fan, but you know, they, they were never ever going to be in it seriously. Um, you know, I should have known it. So okay. how did, cause I know, didn't you intern at WGR when you were a student at Specs or am I wrong about that? I, it was literally my uh, first job in Detroit. So when Henson saw me, I had just started doing weekends at JR. I was doing at the time, you know, my stuff down in Toledo. And then uh, weekends after football and basketball season, I started working at JR. So I was there a couple months and Henson heard me and asked me to come to the fan. And, and so I did. And then uh, in 2016, um, they called me and, you know, they had just landed the Lions and they said, um, we'd like you to come be a part of this. And I, I said, yeah. And I, I known the program director for many years, Mike Wheeler, he helped get me into this business. And, um, so yeah, they brought me on board in 2016 and, you know, I ended up at, uh, JR for almost seven and a half years. It's amazing. Time just flies. Yeah. You did a show uh, with Darren McCarty. Talk a little bit about your time working with Darren on WJR talking about hockey. Is there a better gig in radio? It was pretty cool, you know, and Darren's the same way. You know, people forget Darren it was born just over the border over in Leamington. So growing up for him was the same way that it was for a lot of us, listening to JR, listening to JP in the morning. And, um, you know, JP just seems so larger than life. Yeah. We haven't seen a guy like JP 
since his passing, I don't think we'll see a guy like JP. Uh, you know, really. I think Drew Lane comes the closest, probably. I agree with you. If there was anybody, it would be Drew Lane. But but certainly, I mean, for WJR, that's that's been a void for you know almost thirty years. I mean, really, it, it has. And um, but you know, listening to the Red Wings games, listening to the Tiger games, so to be able to do a show with, with Darren, and then eventually to. Uh, you know, have a small part on the morning show and, and then to be able to do a show with Lomas, it, it was pretty cool. But, you know, all, all good things come to an end and that's the, the business. Well, so I, I, I do want to ask you about your mornings at, at JR. That's a big difference going from a weekly to a, a, a daily show. And you were getting up early. You should have, I should said, have no. said no. Okay. Yep. Okay. I should have said no. Like, I, to be honest with you, Ron, um, I thought I was doing somebody a favor. Um, somebody kind of asked me for a favor and I thought that I was doing somebody a favor. Um, it was, it doesn't seem like it was right for you just because that wasn't a good fit at all. Yeah, It wasn't, it wasn't a good fit at all. I mean, no, no. When I heard about it, it made no no sense to me. I'll be honest just because no, I I have, I have no problem saying it, but as I said, I've always tried to be the guy. If you ask me to go do something, um, I I'm going to give it my best shot. It it wasn't a good fit. I should have said no, um, but you know, I, I thought I was doing somebody a favor and it didn't work. You period. know, what was End a good story. fit? You know, what was a good fit is you and Lomas Brown. I don't think, I know you left, uh, to do your own thing, but, uh, that, that had to be fun. The short time you did work with Lomas. Cause what a, you know, much like, you know, Darren McCarty, but Lomas Brown is just full of life. That guy is, it's a great, great guy by all accounts. He is what you hear is what you get. He's just a, a fantastic guy. And, you know, we had a lot of fun things planned and, you know, we had some barbecues over my house and things like that. And we were, we were planning a lot of events and, you know, it's our business. You know, it, 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 I, I thought that that was something that, you know, to be honest with you, Ron, I was going to do for the next five, 10 years and then kind of sail off into the sunset, but it wasn't meant to be. I get it. I don't, I think anybody in this business, Ron, you can't, you can't, um, you can't be mad at, at situations that happen. We know what we got ourselves into. You can regret situations that that's, but you can't, you can't be mad at situations. No. You know, I mean, it's the, the times we live in. I think. Yeah, they, I get it. It's not. I don't take. You know, I'm not ticked off about anything. You know, like I said a few minutes ago, I, I think there are things that you, you know, you probably shouldn't have done. And that's okay. I, I can be the guy that can raise my hand and said I should I should have said no to that. But I, I'm never going to be mad at somebody that said, hey, um, nothing personal and this isn't performance related, but, you know, we have to make a financial decision. I How do you get mad at that? You right. know, I, you wish everybody all the best and, you know, um, you, you move on to something else. So um, And you did. I, that's the way I feel. And yeah, I'm not being I'm not being PC. Like no. that's that's like right. all the best guys. I don't, you know, I don't wish ill will against well, you. I'm all not the best, gonna but talk time to know, go do something else. My my favorite, I mean, WGR. I mean, that's JP because of you know, and then working with Dick Hafter and people like Guy Gordon oh, and Dick's the best. And uh, you know, don't even start me on Frank Beckman. Don't get enough respect as far as I'm concerned. But uh mm-hmm. uh I, I it is you know, to me, what it once was, because it's not no disrespect to anybody who's there, but WGR isn't what it was. It's just not, and, and I, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I, and I think a lot of that has to do with the time we live in and the decisions that are made. But nevertheless, enough about that, because I'm not white Mike Wallace. I'm not looking to to jack anybody up. You moved on, and you went to. I got to tell you, I, I, I'm I'm excited about your podcast. It's because right when you started sharing it on on social media. Um, I was like, that's a great name for a podcast off the air, off the air. Yeah. That's, it's like, yeah. it's such a twist. First off, before we get to your podcast, how did you come up with that name? Cause it's just brilliant. I Ron, I, on it. Thank you. I, I really think that it, it hit me like a ton of bricks, like literally the day after everything happened at WJR. I, I honestly, I, it was like, okay. That's probably it for me in radio. And and like I'm gonna say it again. That's okay. Like I'm fine with it. You know, I got I got 29 years in, man. You know, there there aren't a lot of people that can right. say that. So right. um, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the positive in each and every situation. And, and that that's the way that I look at it. Um, so I had a couple people reach out to me and you know, say that, you know, you have um um 
you've done a good job of, you know, making a name for yourself and all that stuff. And Ron, I've never taken myself seriously. I'll never take myself serious. So, you know, the, the self doubt in me was, you know, is this going to be successful? I and mean, how many people are going to listen to it? Like, honestly, I, you know, um, I, I think whether people want to admit it or not in this business, insecurity runs rampant anyway. Yeah. Um, but I, I honestly, I think maybe 15 years ago, I took myself way too seriously. I'll be the first guy to admit it. And then uh, I started to practice what I preach because I think in this business, what do we talk about? We talk about things that other people do. Right. <laughs> Why exactly would I be egotistical about right. that? You know? So, um, you know, you have a reality check and, but I had a few people suggest to me, um, and, and people who I really respect that this is something that could be successful and why, why don't you just do it for fun? And Ron, I'm just, I'm doing things my way. And if I want to talk to some hockey guy, for a half hour, I don't have to have my boss screaming at me. Why are you talking to this guy? Oh people gosh. can jump in. People can, you know, listen. And I, I have a list of so many guys coming up in the next few weeks that I'm going to be talking to. It's pretty cool. Pretty much everybody that I reached out to is like, dude, of course I'll do it and everything. And, um, you know, thankfully we've been able to pick up some sponsors and, and working on some more and everything. But I, that's a, I love that I'm you humbled. said that. I, I I, that I'm humbled, Ron. I really am. I'm humbled. Because that's the thing is I, in, in different jobs I've had in radio and I'd, you know, I'd, I remember doing a morning show on a country station and I'd come up with 10 questions that I wanted to ask to say Trace Adkins or Shania Twain or whatever the case may be. And they're like, yeah, nope, you got five minutes. That's why I love doing yeah. this podcast because whether I'm talking to you or a musician, we can go on. I mean, I, I, I've had podcasts that I think Mike Halloran was on for like two hours. Two and a half hours. Dennis Frawley from back in ABX, he was on. So I love the form that you can just lead where the conversation, there's no time limit. And people, you know, yep. I, I get people say all the time, it's like, I don't listen to you in one sitting if it's too long, but I'll come back to it. And that's what I love about these podcasts. And I'm sure you're going to find success with that. I'm glad to hear you're getting some sponsors. That's cool. But what, uh, for people who haven't tuned in or have tuned in, what, what should they expect from this, from this show off the air with Sean Belisian moving forward? Is it just going to be well, sports? Or is it going to be, what, what are you going to have on there? There's, there's going to be different things. I think, you know, at the beginning where it's more stick what you know, I think especially with the Lions being on the run that they have. So we have a few different shows under something called, you know, unsyndicated. Um, you know, off the air is kind of the, the flagship where we're going to be talking about a little bit of everything. And sometimes, you know, I'm going to have uh, my buddy Blake join me who does such a great job. He's one of Mitch's producers and he's the producer of sports rap at 760. And I think the kid knows his stuff and he's a great guy. So I wanted him involved in this. And, you know, the one that I'm having a lot of fun with is what the puck and, um, <laughs> You know, we're going to we're gonna be talking to, you know, guys from yesteryear. We had a great conversation with Ron Duguay, and I have That's so cool. you know, some conversations coming up with some guys that I know. And I don't want to give too much away, but I have a, a few guys locked in. I mean, not I only got a guys request. from yesteryear. I would yeah. love to Brad Park. I can work on that. That can, would be yeah, awesome. I, 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 can, I can work on that. So, uh, but no, to your to your point there, you know, there are a lot of guys from yesteryear that, that I've already talked to. And, um, there are a lot of guys, uh, quite frankly, that, um, are playing right now that I'm going to get on. So, I mean, that's, cool. that's the cool thing about it to me, Ron is, is, you know, I've reached out to so many guys and they were like, what do you need me to do? What do you, that's where, so cool. what do you need me to do? When do you need me? And, you know, both current and former players. So that's pretty cool. And, um, you know, still calling games, still doing some stuff for state champs, you know, I'll do Wayne state in the fall. And, uh, awesome. so yeah, just, just having a blast, man, having a blast. I have to ask you this and anybody who follows you on social media, obviously you're a Red Wings fan. Your, 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 your roots run deep. How did you become a Montreal Canadiens fan? A kid from Detroit. You know How what? did that happen? Yeah. You know, no, you know what? Uh, so my grandfather lived in uh, Stony Point, Ontario. And uh, just just over the uh, just over the bridge in about a, a half hour kind of north, like what is now known as the Lakeshore area. And um, growing up, you know, watching the Habs and uh, watching it with all my, uh, my my relatives there, a lot of Habs fans. We just, you know, that was a team. I thought Larry Robinson was larger than life, and you know, having the opportunity to go there and, and see a bunch of family that that I have there and everything, it just. 
it, it cultivated when I was a kid. So yeah, so cool. uh, go Habs go, right? That's so cool. But before I ask my last question or so, is can you name one thing that you're most proud of over your radio broadcasting career? I know I'm, I know that's kind of a loaded question, but can you think of maybe one wow. you could share with me? Um, can I pick two? Absolutely. I'm going to pick two. Sure. I think having the opportunity to call a game in the National Hockey League, that is every kid like me dream come true. Like it's, it's you know, I'll, I'll take that to my grave with me. And being a Heisman voter, being named um, a Heisman voter uh, That's back cool, in man. 2009 is awesome. You know, th- those are those are little kid things. You know what I mean? Those those are really little kid things. And what I mean by that is, you know, 10-year-old Sean would have gone crazy <laughs> over that. You know, I, I was the kid watching Hockey Night in Canada and watching the Heisman presentation. Um, so to be able to do both of those things, I think, I think, you know, one and two, one and two there. Sean, before we wrap, in your opinion, and you know, you can be as PC as you want, or you can be as harsh as you want. Everybody's opinion uh, varies. But one of my last questions I like to ask folks is, in your opinion, and we kind of touched on this because because you still are technically, even though you're not employed right now by a terrestrial, you're still in the biz. What is your opinion of the state of terrestrial radio today in 2024? I hate to say it because I think. A lot of times people might misconstrue this, Ron, and think that, you know, it's sour grapes or whatever. I don't know how else to tell you it, it isn't sour grapes. It's not good. I worry about the long-term viability. Um, nobody's listening to the radio anymore. I think the younger generation has zero interest in the radio. Um, and, you know, we're moving into different mediums now. And uh, I, I hope that radio stays around forever. Um, but I, when I say that, I say it for the nostalgic, romantic reasons. Yeah. You know, the things that you and I talked about early, early in the show. I, I, I don't, I don't know how radio can sustain the next 10 years. And, and I, I don't think 10 years is being exaggerative either. I, I don't, I don't think that radio can sustain the next 10 years. Not, not without Could reinventing itself, not without reinventing exactly. itself. Exactly. Exactly. You know. If they keep down this road, I, I, Somebody turn out the lights 10 years from now. Uh, the there, Don there, Meredith. There's turn out the lights. The party's yeah, right? over. <laughs> there, there's going to have to be, there's going to have to be something different. The problem is, and I ran into this at the fan, like we were talking about earlier. Um, they face so many challenges before they think that they're too big to fail. Yeah. And that was what we were t- told at the fan. Well, they've spent this money. They went and got all the teams. I, no, 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 nothing's worked. Well, FM was a game changer. And um, I, I think, unfortunately, there are far too many radio people right now that they're taking that mentality. Yeah, I heard this before. Remember when XM was going to put us out of business, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's always going to be a need for local radio. There's also always going to be a need for guys like Ron Robinson or Dick Hafner, you know, to give you the local news. I just, I don't think it's going to be anything, anything like it is right now. Uh, We talked about your podcast, but what's next for Sean Belegian? I don't know. And it's pretty cool. Honestly, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, I, I, I've had the opportunity to go to other places. I, my roots are here. This is where I'm staying. Um, You know, we're, we're going to do this and I'm going to keep, you know, doing my stuff for state champs and, there's another little TV opportunity that I'm not at liberty to say. I'll just say there's cool. a TV opportunity where I might be doing some stuff. But, um, Ron, I always used to be one of those guys when I got in the business, especially when I was in my 20s still. I always used to say, I'm going to be like Ernie Harwell. I, I, I'm going to work until, you know, I'm 85, 90, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, Ron, your priorities change as you get older. Um, I don't want to say the second that I can retire. I'm going to retire. How about 10 seconds later? You know, I, I want to enjoy life. This is, this business has taken up, um, you know, many, many hours for me and, and oftentimes seven days a week, especially in the fall, you know, I mean, you work seven days a week in the fall. You just do. That's part, that's part of the gig. And, um, when it's time, I'll know it's time and you can find me at some, uh, dive somewhere in the Florida Keys. Like when you're driving down Highway One, don't be surprised if you see me sitting on a stool 
uh, sucking on a Corona and lime. And was that Sean Belegian? Was, was that Sean Belegian? I thought yeah, I saw there's, Sean there's a really <laughs> There's a really good chance it's going to be Sean Belegian. So, yeah. Sean, I want to thank you for coming on, sharing your broadcast story, my friend. It's been a blast. Thank you. Anytime. It's a great uh, chat with you, my friend. Continued success. Thank you. Uh, thanks again to Sean Belegian, and thank you for checking out Radio Days, the podcast. Today's podcast, again, is sponsored by Radio Days, 101 Years of Radio, a new documentary series about the history of radio. You could hear that, that story from those who lived it. You can also watch this entire five-part series on the free streaming service called Reveal, that's R-E-V-E-E-L, or On Demand at Vimeo. Find more about that at my website, ronrobinsonstudios.com. Today's show is produced by Ron Robinson Studios. Head over to ronrobinsonstudios.com where you can also hear previous episodes of this podcast or streamcast, as it were, as well. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the aforementioned documentary about the history of radio, Radio Days, 101 Years of Radio, click on the Radio Days movie under the Documentaries tab at ronrobinsonstudios.com. Thanks for checking out the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time. You can't go! All the plants are gonna die!